Hello and welcome everybody to Clegan's webinar on the SKIP updates, basically changes in SKIP database requirements. Uh, I'm your host today, Bruce Calder. I'm the VP of Consulting Services here at Clegan. So I'm going to talk about a lot of things. Um, and I'm going to talk as much or more updates and guidance. So a lot of what we're going to talk about is actually more clarification. There are some changes or upcoming changes to the data set, but they're not that monumental. Um, the main changes are actually in um, a lot more of the guidance and clarification, especially around component and product grouping. And these, we've expected this since day one. This is, makes a lot of sense. This is a very particular way uh, to look at it. Um, so what we have here is, first we're gonna talk a little bit about Skip and the compliance process. The so one we do with a lot of companies and, and it's really working out, the idea of, of managing it, and more and more companies are doing this as product templates and component templates, and there's a lot of use. So we're gonna go through that a bit quickly. We've talked about it before because the next sections will make a lot more sense. And we're gonna talk about the concept of component grouping, using generic components, say brass components, instead of listing every single letter brass component and, and what the guidance is on that. Then we're gonna talk about product grouping, especially for, for professional products where you can group within some limitations, what the rules are behind it, products together in a single listing. Consumer products currently don't have the same uh, leeway. They're still having to be done by the UPC code. Now that might change, because the current guidance says it's really done by the barcode or UPC code for consumer products, but professional products have a lot more leeway, or will have a lot more leeway on product grouping. There'll be some rules around that. So I'm gonna talk a lot basically about the, the guidance you're gonna start seeing soon, but more specifically tangible rules, like what can you do and what you can't do. And then I'm gonna talk about some data set changes. None of them are that particularly earth shattering. Um, moving number of components to from um, a mandatory and optional field. We still use it, but now it's an optional field. The fact that it's 12 brass components versus 15 or vice versa, isn't really enforceable. So we're gonna go over all that, some minor changes in the made in EU field. Then we're gonna have Q and A. So it's intended to last 50 minutes. However, if this morning is a bit of a indicator, probably 45 minutes with about 15 minutes Q and A. There was tremendous questions. So if you have questions, please feel free to submit it. We're gonna be talking about more clarifications and guidance, and that's hopefully gonna help a lot. So we're talking about the substance of concern in articles as such in complex objects products, SKIP. Now this is made from the same people that created the CoRAP chemical list, which is the Community Rolling Action Plan, or CoRAP, where they put the O in there so the list isn't exactly the acronym that they meant it to be. So the CoRAP list of chemicals, the chemicals that are usually the precursor list to become SVHCs, it's, it's original review and it's CoRAP. So they put the same people with ECA and SKIP. Um, now, one of the reasons why they do acronyms is because it's a lot easier to relate. You often have to communicate a simple term to your management and say, this is the SKIP database. They may never heard about it, but of course, if you tell them 10 or 20 times, they'll eventually start to get it. Same thing happened to ROHS originally, where, some, where the compliance person would talk to the management. They had no idea what ROHS was. Now everybody knows. So one of the advantages with, of course, the ad acronym, it's easier to communicate to someone else. It's very tangible. Um, many years ago, uh, we won a number of awards, and one of the presenters at the awards was a magician. He's actually a former tax lawyer turned magician. Pretty common, uh, definitely a field change, probably not. But it's fantastic. He showed us a lot about preparation. Definitely a lot of uh, the main part of being a magician is definitely preparation. A lot of showmanship, but a lot of preparation. But one thing that really stuck is he talked about why is David Copperfield the most successful magician in the world? And successful means he makes Beyonce plus uh, money. And why he's so successful? And you can talk about showmanship or, you know, the quality of what he does and so on and so forth. But he's like, no, the key one is all of his tricks are one sentence long. You can communicate it to someone else. Uh, he walked through the wall of China. He made a 747 disappear. It's something you can communicate to someone else. And that's one of the advantages of acronyms. Even though Skip is kind of clunky when you look at its long name as such or in complex objects. But Skip is something you can communicate. And so that's one thing they're, they're definitely stressing, especially when you have these new requirements that you're going to have to communicate often to management. And it needs to be something so tangible, not a long paragraph, a simple elevator speech or simple sentence that they pick up on. And so that's why you see a lot of acronyms like SKIP, the SKIP database. It makes it easier for you to communicate to someone else a lot of long explanation. And hopefully, if you say it enough times, 
people will start to let it sink in. Um, the skip database, say six months or a year ago, people are going, well, that's not real. Or this waste directive database, this isn't real. But you said skip enough times, people start to believe it's real. So the prototype version has been available for some time, and that's what we're going to be talking about or using. It's not the final version. You don't register in the current database. It's really a system to create the I6Z file that you'll eventually submit. Submission is really easy. It'll literally be drag, drop. And the final version and the ability to drag, drop it in should be ready in October. Things could delay that, but um, these software folks have been working in the IUCLID system for better than a decade, meeting deadline after deadline for chemical registration. They probably will meet this one. And I'm sure they can work just functionally at home. So... October is currently the planned uh, release of the version where you can register it. But the current version, you can still create files and send the files from person to person. It's, there's be some very small modifications we'll talk about, but they're almost window dressing what the changes are going to be. So we've talked about this before, and we have a, a lovely, uh, I'm putting a plug in here, April 1st webinar, where we physically took apart a coffee machine and identified the reach SVHCs in it. And this product would have to be registered in the database because it has SVHCs above 0.1% by weighting components. And there's four different component types or component groups. And we break it up by com generic component groups. I'll explain why. So it's a consumer product, so it has to go in by barcode or UPC code. So if it has a red version, a green version, a black version, they're all separately listed. However, they'll be basically clones or copies of one another. It has to go in because it has lead solder in the diodes in the bottom left. It has ADCA, the blowing agent, in the closed cell phone above right, which is not as well known as SVHC, but it's the third most enforced SVHC. It has lead brass in the actual prongs. In reality, this one did not. We put this one in an example, but it didn't. And it has D6 monomer in silicone, which is relatively common. So because of each one of these things, it has to go into the database. It and the article and the SVHC. So the minimum requirement, and this is one thing you'll see more in the guidance, you've seen probably an example before where you have a car and then they declare an engine and then the O-ring has the chlorine plus. They don't say it's the chlorine plus, but it's an EPDM O-ring uh, with the, the SVHC around 10%. That's the chlorine plus um, in it. You can put the engine in there, but it's not required. The legal requirement is a sold objects object, which is the coffee machine here. The SVHC, we'll say the lead down below left, and the article. It's the high temp solder or the diode, depending how you want to define it. But we normally use high temp solder. Um, there's a number of different parts that have high temp solder off of the RHS 7A. We group them together. The high temp solder, um, it's really easy to list it as the same materials group. And you'll see why, how that's really useful. So if you've got a really complex product, like a you know blood analyzer the size of my desk, it'll have two or three of these per board times 10 or 15 boards. It'll have 30 to 50 of these. So it's a lot easier to group them together instead of listing every single blooming diode, alternative diode on your product. So substance grouping, it's a big, or component grouping is gonna be a big part of what we're gonna talk about. So uh, that's a wonderful diagram. I love the flow chart. It's really graphic. However, really, you really need to get it into IUCLID eventually and the I6Z file. Now the file is really a zip file. It's quite portable. Um, it's really easy to send from one person to another. And if you, if I make one and send it to you and you go into IUCLID and literally drag drop it in, it'll repopulate and re-expand. If you want to register it, you can just email it to somebody, say somebody in the US builds it, you can send it to somebody else, European entity, who just literally drag drops it into the system in October to register. Like it's very, very portable. It is a little large file because it carries the entire IUCLID data set with it. It's uh, quite large. However, it's really straightforward, portable file. But what we want to do eventually is to create those that you can just send to someone else or just drag drop into the actual final registration. So the graphical one on the left is really good for understanding, but eventually has to turn into what's on the right. The way most companies are doing it, and is a big difference in the ones that are creating the files and the ones that are just still going out for quoting for people to do things. A lot of people want to sell you things around this, fair enough. Um, what you really want to do, though, is create a declaration. Um, when in doubt, leverage someone like ourselves. We really have done tons and tons of these. We do literally two or three web demonstrations, uh, product declarations with companies a week. We do it all the time. And, and we're a big fan of hanging together instead of hanging separately. If you're going to be wrong, be wrong, good company. This is the way most companies are doing it now. And it's a lot easier way to do it is you separate 
the product information from the component templates. And we'll talk about the component templates a lot because it's a big part of this, where the product template is, here's the coffee machine, here's its customs code, its UPC code, and it has this many of each declarable component. And all the SVHC and safe use instructions and materials categories are in these generic component templates. These are component groups, like brass component, um, that are used by all the company's products. So typical electronic product, for example, they may have different parts in it. You might have one product that's similar, but has very different parts to the next one. Chances are they all have leaded brass components. So you want to create templates or have someone like ours create templates that every single product can link um, to that component. So it's really, really effective way. And so when you're creating a skip declaration, you're really just doing an accounting exercise, the product level, and, and how many of each component you have. And then you have component templates already pre-built. And if you're doing data, supplier data gathering, testing and engineering evaluation is generally a lot more effective. But even if you're using supplier data, you're going to need component templates. And we'll explain why. So when it says, your supplier says, yes, we have lead in our inrush uh, cutoff thermistor, that's not an IUCLA declaration. You still have to have the lead, the high temp solder um, template to attach to. So explain all of that. So the product template is your simple, non-technical. What's the um, name of the product? What's its UPC or GPC code for consumer products? Professional products will often do it by model. This is my AF model um, product. And underneath that, you'll have a second line that says the AF model includes the F100, the F200, and the F300, and all the different variations therein. And we'll talk about product grouping. So I've talked about these brass components, the component grouping. I'll talk about product grouping in a minute. And I'm going to go through this a bit briefly because just to give you an idea why the next topics are so important. So this the idea is you create a product, and what it really does is just list how many of each product grouping, brass component, closed cell foam, silicone component, it has. So we have the coffee machine. Here's its UPC code. It's a consumer product, so it's at UPC or GPC code level. It's customs code, article category. Um, and then how many brass components it has, closed cell foam components, silicone components, but no SVHC information. The SVHC information is all held in the component template. So you can have 15 different, you make, you know, five different coffee makers, you make some toaster ovens, some blenders. A lot of them have brass components. And it's just a matter of counting each and how, and what you'd want at the end of the day is each one just using the same brass component template. So you're not, creating every time you have a declarable SVHC, you're not creating a whole IUCLID file for that component. You're just linking it to the brass component file. So the component templates, which is a lot of the component groupings. So instead of listing, this is my brass standoff in this product, this is now my brass hinge, this is the brass prong, each one independently, grouping them into a single brass component. And we'll talk about the new guidance and the rules around that in a moment. So um, this often involves technical experts who create the the component declaration, very easy to outsource. And then because there only are about 40 different really SVHC declarable component types. Sure, there's 200 plus SVHCs, but at the end of the day, there's only a handful that are normally in products for a lot of reasons. And amongst those, they're only in certain materials. There's a whole reason for it. Sure, lead is one of the most common. You'll find it as lead solder, lead metal. You'll find it as lead metal in brass. You'll find it as lead metal in aluminum and lead metal in steel. After that, there's not many other situations where you'll find lead that's allowed. Sure, you can find lead in PVC as a stabilizer, but it's not supposed to, it's not allowed to be there for something like ROHS. Now that phthalates are restricted in, in electronics, they have even less declarables. You won't have phthalates or SCCPs uh, because of that. So it's easy to outsource to technical experts, very reusable, and no matter what your solution plan is, you're going to need them. So if you're testing, which is easily the most effective and really good, especially for new products, um, will identify, yes, you have EGDME in your battery. You're going to need a, a component template for EGDME or 1,4-dimethyloxoethane um, for button cell battery. So you need a button cell battery template, perfectly normal. Or you can do engineering evaluation, which is one, especially for professional products, one of the most effective methods to get you going. So one of our is the most pro, uh, popular services, we do it two or three times a week, is we sit down with a company, we explain the rules, and then we do an engineering evaluation of their product with them. If it's small enough, they send it to us, and we do it on camera and literally point out the materials, make it very tangible, and why we're going to declare what components. 
Um, we supplement it. We'll also build materials information um, and whatever else they have available. If it's a bigger or larger product, product, we usually do it from pictures. We'll explain what we need and you can do it easily from a smartphone um, and we'll walk you through it and be very tangible. And then create the Excel declarations and then in the IU Clean ones and really explain how to do it, make it much more uh, process oriented and simpler. And from then on, uh, you're more than able to do it, but we can also do it for you. It's really straightforward. So um, there's a lot of value in the engineering evaluation, especially when we include the component templates. That's one of the biggest uh, values, of course, the engineering evaluation, the web demonstration is the, the component templates come with it. Or if you're doing data gathering, which you'll find will have a lot of gaps, um, your suppliers will be wrong. And about 50% of the time, uh, the supplier SVHC data per product doesn't match the final product. We do a lot of testing. We know reality. 50% of the SVHCs the supplier declares are not actually declarable in the final product and vice versa. Usually 50% of the SVHCs we find were not declared by suppliers. But there are use to data gathering, especially supplementing your engineering evaluation. You can add information to it. And, but even if you do data gathering, you trust it implicitly, and you basically said, hey, look, my diode, it says it has lead. Awesome, not an IUCLID declaration. What you'll need is to connect it to a component template, for usually for high temp solder. And we'll explain a lot of that. So even if you're using data gathering um, and, and what you gather from suppliers will have use, but you still need the component templates. Having, yes, I've identified, I have Decorium Plus in the heat shrink, awesome. So now what? Uh, well, so what you need now is a heat shrink template. Hopefully use the same one over and over again, which contains the chlorine plus. So when that gets declared by supplier amongst your products up to the times, you just use the same component template over and over and over again. It's a lot easier. So component templates like this, here's one for silicone, here's one for brass. And we, because it's an internal part, you can use whatever reference part number you want. Um, we use SI01, and then we use a second article name to describe it better. So includes silicone washers, gaskets, seals, tubes, wires, O-rings, and similar silicone components. And then you need a customs code, and then whether or not it's made in the EU, which we're saying unwilling to disclose because it's a generic part. Safe use instructions. The current system, you have to put what candidate list, which SVHC list you're working to. However, in the new version, it's going away. We're not 100% sure how they're gonna monitor what's updated and what's not. Could be by revision number, I don't know, but that field is going away. Um, and then what SVHC it has, this one's dodeca methyl cyclohexosiloxane, D6, which is, the reason they call it D6 is because of this. Wait until you see the real name Decorin Plus. It takes a while to say it. And that's why they all call it Decorin Plus. So that's D6, it's a pull-down menu, it's concentration range, and then you have to have its materials category, rubbers and elastomers, silicone rubber. That's one of the key items. Now, um, I went through this very briefly. What I'm going to do is actually talk about the new guidance, and then it'll feed back into this. So we've been doing this since day one. There's a lot more guidance coming out explaining why this is viable, why you're allowed to do this, and what are the rules around it. So grouping up components. And that's a lot of what we're doing with generic parts. We're component grouping. I'm not listing in the IQ Good de Declaration every single blooming brass component individually. That's not helpful. So what we're doing is creating a brass component template or grouping we just use over and over again. It's technical, but once you agree upon it, you can keep using it. And it's extremely popular, definitely in businesses that are center led and business unit executed. So where the center provides guidance, the goalposts, like you have to meet these goalposts, you have to create the IUCLID files by this date. Um, and here are the templates to use. And then the business units are responsible for populating and doing the work. So it's really popular that way also, when you have a center led business unit executed compliance strategy, where a lot of the compliance budgets are fundamentally at the business unit levels. However, there's a lot that can be done at the corporate level to provide both guidance and goalposts. So grouping components, um, the idea is to group similar subcomponents in a component declaration. So the original request came from small and medium enterprise, really SME United, one of the main associations. And they're basically saying, there's a need to develop criteria that allows grouping of similar components, articles in one notification, which made a lot of sense at the time and follows the Article 33 notification requirements. You gotta identify the sold product, the SVHC, and the component it's in. And as much as you say, hey, it's in component part 13752, that means nothing to the end user anyways. Saying it's a brass component is far more useful. So um, for group, they, it, so there's be guidance to be coming out, and you'll see it probably first in your individual associations, FAQs or guidances. 
Um, the echo one will probably come later. There'll be a certain, well, certain amount of hand waving. And the ones from individual associations will be more specific usually um, to their product type. But it's basically the idea of grouping similar components into a listing, like brass components. So you're allowed to put similar components in a single component declaration, like brass components. But there are going to be rules around it, and there'll be some hand-wavy parts of the rules. We're going to make it a little more succinct. We do this all the time. We've created so many declarations. It's just once you've done it a lot, you pretty well know exactly what the rules are going to be. So. And we talked about the product template, the coffee machine. Down below in a product template, you see it has each one of the component groupings. Brass components, which is lead and brass. Closed cell foam, which is ADCA and, and polyethylene foam. Silicone, which is D6 and silicone. Aluminum component, which is lead and aluminum. So on and so forth. And all you're doing is you have these generic components at the product level. You're just identifying how many of each they have. Now, the field on number of occurrences is becoming optional field. We still use it because I don't want to list every single brass component. I just want to say brass component and then how many. On the bright side, since it's an optional field, I said five silicone components here. If it ends up being three, there's not no penalty for it. We thought there are five. Turns out there are three. We met the minimum requirement. This field is now optional. We did best efforts. As long as we declare the coffee maker, the silicone component, and the fact it's got Inside the silicone template, D6, we've met all the legal requirements. It's a lot easier grouping and then have a reasonable estimate of the number of parts of each component. So the silicone component we've talked about before, this is a typical grouping. Silicone component, which includes washers, gaskets, seals, tubes, wires, O-rings, and similar silicone components. They share the same customs code. They share the same safe use instructions. They share, share the same SVHC, and they share the same materials code. And I'll explain why that's also important. So these are the grouping rules. It might be a bit hand waving the guidance, but this is fundamentally what they are. You have to be able to describe the generic component by the same generic name. It's got to be able to describe it accurately by the same name. Brass components is fine. Metal components, it could be a lot of different things. Um, and you can't just say blue stuff. That's not very helpful either. It has to basically, whatever's being listed there has to be, be described. If you say brass components and it includes polyethylene, obviously that those parts can't go together. So it has to be, whatever you use a descriptor, like brass components, and that's why we use the sub name, which gives all, it could be any of these things plus another category. So it has to be able to be described reasonably. They have to share the same customs code. That's kind of important. Now, most brass components do, but if you had steel components, which are also lead, they share the same SVHC, but their customs codes will be different and their materials codes will be different. So they have to have the same customs code. They have to have the same SVHC. So if a part has lead in brass, they can use that one. If a different part is cadmium in brass, which if it's ROHS compliant, they're not allowed. But imagine this is a big x-ray machine for an airport. It's so large, it doesn't need to be ROHS compliant. It could have cadmium and brass and perfectly allowed. It'll be a different generic. It'll be another component type because it's different SVHC. So you might have to have a brass component for cadmium if for some reason you're using non-ROHS compliant cadmium uh, brass. Um, so they have to share the same customs code, same SVHC or SVHCs. Silicone is normally declared D6, but it could also have D5 and D4. They have to share the same SVHCs. Shame the Share, shame, mm, good one. Share the same materials code. Um, so we talked about this one. The silicone is rubbers and elastomers silicone rubber. If this was neoprene, which wouldn't have D6 anyways, it, it's not the same materials category. It's a pull-down menu. They have to have the same materials category. So it has to be the same materials code. Brass has a different code than steel. That's why you can't just put brass and steel in the same generic component. And it has to be a simple article. And a simple article means you can't, reasonably dismantle it into sub-articles. So the, the court case in the European Court of Justice in 2015 saying a complex product is actually made up of simple articles. Um, so it has to be a simple article. It can't be reasonably just be dismantled in separate components. And it's a bit hand wavy, especially if you get to really small things, nobody really cares. But it basically can't be further dismantled. So you have a brass component. Some people might say, well, you could take that piece of brass off. You never, well, maybe it's two component brass components. Not really a big deal. But if you say, hey, my article is a power supply and has lead in it, no, a power supply is a complex object. You can't declare a power supply. The court case says it's component level. You'd have to declare lead and brass in it. So example of the way you can do component grouping. Brass component, and then you usually have a sub name, which gives it more definition, brass standoffs, connectors, tubings, prongs, and other brass components. They share the same customs code, 741999. 
By the way, a lot of customs codes are arguable. You could probably come up with a separate one for brass components. Quite interesting, actually. Um, the SVHC in it is lead. Its materials category is metal dash brass, and it's a brass component. It really can't be reasonably disassembled into different components. It's not like a power supply or an engine or something else, the complexity that can be taken apart. You can sit there with a connector and argue that, yeah, it can be taken apart and have a really metaphysical conversation about what's an article inside a connector. You're just declaring the metal in the brass in the connector anyways. So simple, metal, brass, lead. So all these brass components that are basically lead and brass use one generic component template, one grouping over and over and over again. It's a lot simpler. So you can group them together. They meet all that they, they can be described the same way, same customs code, same SVHC, same materials category, and they're a simple article. You, know, you can't reasonably disassemble it into sub-articles. One you can't use would be saying, instead of brass components, I want to say metal components, because my aluminum, brass, and steel are all lead. So I'd say standoffs, connectors, tubes, prongs, and other components made of aluminum, brass, or steel. Their customs codes aren't the same. Their materials categories aren't the same. When you go into IU Clid, brass has a different pull down than steel. They're not the same material. You have to separate aluminum and brass and steel. They all have the same SVHC and they're all simple articles, but they're not the same customs code and they're not the same materials category. So you have they can't be blended together. So there are some limitations. You can't just stuff everything in the same bucket, put a lid on it, hope it smells nice. It doesn't always work out. So it, you still have to meet each one of these. Um, another one, you put say power supply. And this happens to a lot of companies we talk to. Yeah, our power supply manufacturer said it had these three SVHCs. Awesome. So what are you going to declare an IU clip? The power supply. Can't do that. You have to declare the components, the leaded brass, the, the DMAC and the Nomax, um, the, the lead and the high-time solder. It has to be at the component level. And the reason is, even though you could describe it as an external power supply and give it its customs code for external power supply and call it lead, materials category, that probably falls apart. What's the, what's the pull-down materials category for power supply? There isn't one. The reason you can't do that, it's not a simple article. You can take your power supply apart into simple articles. So you, you can be reasonably disassembled into the brass standoff, into the, the current limiter, into the diodes, the plug, et cetera. So um, you can't take a complex product and use it as the final component. Now, you can choose, take a power, somebody gives you a power, power supply I Euclid declaration if you want to spend the money of effort that has a links to their brass component, their Nomex, and their high temp solder, um, but you don't have to do that. You do have to have, realize when you have a high power supply that says these SPHCs, you have to have multiple component templates to draw upon. So that's one of the challenges in data gathering. You're gonna get situations like this, the power supply manuf uh, manufacturer says, yes, we have these three SPHCs. Okay, guess what? You're gonna need components, templates underneath it, and you're gonna need multiple, often from multiple power supplies. So there's usually easier ways to do that. We find engineering evaluations much easier. Nice thing is, is most of what's in the power supply is declarable is already in the main product. And it's just a counting exercise, which, by the way, is not enforced. I said five brass components. They're like at seven. Well, it's optional field. Close enough. There's no enforcement for it. So even if you do supplier data gathering, you need um, component templates. So imagine you're gathering data and the resistor supplier says we have lead or lead oxide. So uh, spoiler alert, those aren't actually declarable SVHCs. The 7C1 exemption in resistors and diodes is actually leaded glass. It is technically not lead or lead oxide. It's lead metal or lead oxide, not leaded glass as the SVHC. So they're actually not declarable. But even in rush current limiter, so these little round fellers that stand up uh, on two of the legs, the middle of it is a high temp solder. Right, right where you see the in the epoxy, this little part sticking out is high temp solder right there. It'd probably be easier if I had a picture. And my waving my hands right now is probably not helpful. I'm enjoying it, but I don't think you're seeing a lot from it. Um, the high temp solder is lead. It's lead metal. metal. So when you see an inrush current limiter and it says lead, it actually is lead declarable. And so you have the high temp solder component template. A brass connector, they say have lead. So you just point to the brass component template. You have heat shrink where they declare dechlorine plus, which is a very common uh, replacement for DECA BDE. It's really effective for thin polyolefins. Um, unfortunately, for better or for worse, as common as it is, it's going to be banned under POP in the next couple of years in Europe and under the Canadian Prohibition, um, probably sometime around 2023. So it's it's a substance that's coming along, suddenly going to be banned. But right now, it's just declarable. That's the chlorine plus, the heat shrink. So you'd have a heat shrink template. Now, one of the challenges, you're going to have probably two different heat shrink templates. One is for the chlorine plus, which is usually dark heat shrink. 
as the flame retardant. If you have light heat shrink, it's often TMPP, trinonylphenol phosphite. Uh, it's one of the new SVHCs. It's an antioxidant. It's very common in light color heat shrink to prevent oxidation uh, when it's extruded. Uh, it's also not that uncommon in poly bags and that little film, you have a protective film sometimes on the screens of products when you ship it. Uh, TMPP is, is not uncommon in those. It's one of the newest SVHCs. Most people don't know it exists. It's actually relatively common, not super common, but it's relatively common. So you need component templates. So even if you get good supplier data, you're going to need a translation table. I got this read. I got a 7A. 7A is really easy. It's always high temp solder. 7C1 is a bit of a complexity because most of the time it's actually not declarable. It's lead in glass in a resistor or diode, so it's not declarable. Um, the exception is when they declare PZT, lead zirconate titanate, in a buzzer that actually is a declarable SVHC. Not lead, lead zirconate titanate. PZT is an SVHC on its own. So if they declare PZT, then you go, okay, fine. Therefore, I'm going to have my piezo buzzer um, declarable. So even if you do a supplier data gathering, um, you're going to need a component template uh, relationship. So we have companies basically, hey, look, it's they said SVHC of lead in the inrush current limiter. Awesome. That's not a skip declaration. But I just put lead in the system. Like, nope, you actually have to put the component in there. High temp solder and its materials codes and customs codes and all the good stuff in life. But you don't want to do it for each individual limiter or diode uh, or, or other high temp solder using device. You just want a high temp solder component template and to say it uses template seven or whatever. It's much easier. So you're allowed to do that again, of course, if they can describe it the same way, high temp solder, same customs code, same materials category, and same SVHC. Now, batch grouping of components. Professional products also have some ability to group the saleable items together, the high-level declaration, not just the components, but the top-level stuff. Uh, there's some limitations around it, and they came from the same request. Uh, SME United definitely was one of the main champions, but as many others, said there is a need to develop criteria that allows grouping of similar components or articles into one notification. So that's the ability to group products. Now, in the current guidance, consumer products can't do that. They're still at the individual barcode or customs code level. Professional products, especially professional components, have a lot more leeway to blend. So for professional products, consumer products still have to be by UPC or barcode. The current guidance says basically if the consumer picks up the product and turns around and reads the barcode or UPC code, they need to be able to go from that to the IU code listing. Professional products don't have that. So um, the requirements of products is they have to be able to be described by the same common name. This is like the AF series analyzer or AF model analyzer. Share the same customs code and have the same SVHC containing components. Now, some can be a subset where we get commonly say we'll take a, oh, we'll say something analyzes, we'll say solutions for COVID. And it's a big tester and does lots of different things. It's wonderful. And because of it, you can have different handling options and different robotic arms and this, that, and the other thing, but they're all basically the same model. And what they normally do is, is put something representative of the macro model there. And then and says it has seven brass components, you know, 47 high temp solder, which is not abnormal, it's just in that size. And basically in the product description, say this represents the SM or AF100, AF200, AF300, and any similar products. And because the, and you'll see later, the number of each component is now an optional field. If it's 47 in a product and it's 22 in the other, it's not enforceable. That's fine. Um, but the main thing is they have to be able to describe the same name, same customs code, and basically same SVHC containing components. So we'll use SM, two nice little letters, model analyzer. The SM model analyzer, we'd use its name. Underneath its sub name, the optional field you say includes the SN 1000X, the SN 2000X, and the SN 3000X. Um, they all share the same customs code. You might even say includes the SN 1000X, 2000X, 3000X, and any variations or accessories included. Here's the customs code, and they contain brass components, steel components, high temp solder, closed cell foam, and cement trimmer potentiometer. The cement trimmer potentiometer exemption 34 to ROHS is a neat one. It's lead oxide that's actually lead oxide. So lead oxide is used to make thick film resistors becomes leaded glass and it's leaded glass in, in a uh, thick film resistor. In this case, it's actually an adhesive layer that holds the ceramic down. So the lead oxide is an adhesive layer and actually lead oxide. 
as opposed to leaded glass. So it ends up being this kind of a unique situation where the trimmer pots have a lead oxide SVHC declarable. So they have their own object, these trimmer pots. Um, mostly we only see these in big professional units. They're used for tuning or calibration. Um, consumer products normally don't have these, uh, but they're pretty common in, in more advanced professional and they have their own type, but they're all the same thing. They're lead oxide ceramic, uh, lead oxide holds the ceramic down. Um, they all have it. Um, it's pretty normal stuff. So as long as they all have these declarables and some might have more than others, again, you just put a reasonable number, brass components, uh, 12, turns out this unit is eight. Not enforceable. As long as you declared the brass components and the number's close enough, it's an optional field, you're fine. We still use the number of components because it's easier to list each brass component one after another. We say brass components, um, based on the evaluation seven. So again, we the practical plan is always two templates, product template, and it's basically a counting exercise of how many each of the component groups it has. And then the component templates, which are separate. Uh, when we do projects for companies, where component templates are a big part. And they're basically the, the detailed materials, codes, and safe use instructions, and all the detailed pieces. So um, there are a few things that are changing in the data set. They're mostly window dressing. So the number of components, like the number of brass components, the number of closed cell components is becoming an optional field. We still use it because it's a lot easier than, than listing each closed cell foam. But if the number's off, there's no penalty for it. So close enough is fine. So two closed cell foam, sure. That box might have three, it's fine. We'll just say two, close enough. Um, because an optional field now, close enough is fine. Zero is a little bit different, it doesn't have it, and so we wouldn't include it in the declaration, but any number above one is um, close enough is fine. We still use it instead of listing every brass component separately. It's just a lot easier. But it's an optional, currently if you log in, if you create a declaration today, it's a mandatory field. It's an optional field that we still use because it's just convenient. Also, it's convenient because if we're off by a number, it doesn't matter. Um, the made in EU field is changing. It's mostly window dressing. It's going from yes, it is made in the EU. No, it's not. Withheld to more specifically, yes, it is made in the EU. No, it's not made in the EU. It is both made in the EU, not in the EU, which is rare, but does happen, or not available. Basically, we're not saying which is kind of similar than above, except for the, the mixed situation. But the actual pull down is changing, mostly window dressing. And the last one is the candidate list version, which is in the current one. You have to, so one of the hardest parts about creating IUCLID declaration the first time nowadays is you actually literally have to drag in yourself the SVHC list, the I6Z for the SVHC list into the system. Now it's an easy download, drag, drop, like drop. But, and if, and if we've done an I6Z file for you, it's already self-contained or bring it with it. And once you have it in once in your system, we can just keep reusing it, which is just kind of weird because the customs codes, the materials category, everything else is already there. The SVHC list is not. So they're kind of changing that so it'll already be resident in the system. It, it's not, so the field will go away. We're not 100% sure, or reasonably sure, how they're gonna manage to what list something's declared to going forward. Um, that's not clear, but this field as it is today is going away. Mostly because right now you actually literally on your own have to drag the SVHC list in there. Once you have it into your system, it's there, you just start using it. It's a bit of an odd thing. So that's going away in the file version. You don't have to drag it in anymore. The field isn't there ex explicitly. I'm not 100% sure how they're gonna manage um, revision control. That's a really good question for them. So again, the practical plan, especially when they allow grouping, is you have a product template, which for consumer products that individual. So if you have a red coffee maker, a green coffee maker, and a black coffee maker, they're all different UPC codes. They have to have different, currently different IUCLID listings. However, one is just a clone of the others, and it's just changing the name. So you just clone, copy, and change the name. Professional products, as long as it can be described the same way, same customs code, and same as FHC declarables, you can merge them within reason. Component templates are the generic templates as long as they can be described the same way, same SVHC, same customs code, um, same materials category, and are simple components, like a power supply can't go here, but an aluminum component can. Button cell batteries are complicated semantics. <laughs> batteries are a complicated situation where there's an electrolyte inside, which people would see as a chemical, but it has been historically by all the battery manufacturers declared as an article. So it ends up kind of being one thing. It's a bit of a strange one. Um, flexible circuit board is also an interesting detail. Is the copper separate than the Kapton? Good question, because it's actually the DMAC in the Kapton. 
that's the declarable. So um, basically a simple component that can't be reasonably disassembled close enough, like a flexible circuit board. Um, so you have one for each component grouping. So again, you need anything from us. We're probably the highest volume uh, test lab, especially in North America for this. We test all the time. If, if you're doing a lot of regulations, you got a new product, reach us VHC, uh, Proposition 65, we're probably the experts, easily the experts in Prop 65, EUMDR. We can test for it. If you're doing one, the rest are very straightforward doing the same time. It's the fastest, most definitive way to handle it. And it's usually a lot less expensive than data gathering. It's also very decisive from a time point of view. This is when you're going to get the answer. It's a lot easier. Um, our last webinar was an example on how we do the monthly or quarterly updates where we sit down with you every month or every quarter, depending on your cycle, and we explain what's changed in this world. What are the new regulations? What are the new Canadian restricted substances coming out? Well, what are the new SVHCs? Are they going to be in your product? Um, Tosca, et cetera. Explain what's changed and how it affects your product. In some cases, how it doesn't. Yes, it looks like it does, but as you make laboratory equipment, it's not in scope of this, et cetera. So, um, so it's really, really popular. It's very easy. You can bring as many stakeholders as you want, and we explain the changes. You ask questions. One of the problems with this one, this format here in the webinar, it's not that interactive. But if you have any questions, please feel free to submit it into this panel. I'll get to as many as possible. But it's not the same of you going back and forth saying, I have this, and this is, this is how it, we're selling it, and then explaining how it applies to you. The monthly and quarterly updates are much more interactive. And of course, in this space, Skip, super popular. We do it two or three times a week, different companies. And just with your product, we'll basically explain the rules on how to create the declaration and then take one of your products and create the SPHC, then Skip declaration with you. And if it's a small enough product, you can ship it to us and we will do it with multiple cameras and show you close-ups of this material we're declaring and this is why and make it very tangible. It's a lot more interesting than PowerPoint. PowerPoint's wonderful and has its uses, but actually showing you this is your gasket. This is when I pull out the product. It's not the product. It's the twist tie around the power cord. That's your problem. And explaining what's going to be the declarables can be very, very tangible. And then we create with the first the Excel templates, product and component templates, and then the IUCLID files for you to give you a much better process and how to do this. And then going forward, you can manage it or much more enable, but we can also, with the process implemented, easily help you with your skip or create skip declarations for you. Once the process is implemented, it's more of a counting exercise. It's much easier. So um, if you need anything, just contact us. If you want something tested, literally just send us a picture of the web link. It's that simple. We'll give you the costing. We test all the time. Like it's it's something we do quite a bit. Um, these are the highest volume. We do anything and everything. I'm a consumer and medical and and Tons and tons of laboratory equipment, but there's like tables and chairs and be amazed what goes through, especially for Proposition 65. Um, if you have any questions, of course, please feel free to sit in the control panel and I'll try to get to as many as possible. Great question. Is the January 5th date locked in or what's the possibility to be delayed? Now, the January 5th deadline for SKIP is actually right in the legislation. So changing it is not in the purview of ECA. It doesn't mean it can't be changed, but something that has to go through the commission and parliament. And right now, since it's next year, they're not really in a hurry to change it. What they want to do is figure out where COVID ends and what they're going to do, and then look at the 2021 deadline. Because if they're going to change it in legislation, which is more involved, they want to make sure they get it right. So if the deadline was September, they'd probably be doing something about makes the decisions about it right now. But since this is next year, they probably won't make any decisions about it until the fall. And then it has to go through parliament, et cetera. A different one is the medical device regulations pushed back a year, but that had a May deadline. This was a little bit different. It still had to go through the legislative changes, but it was a May deadline. It was something that was more now that had to be done. Do you think recyclers will really use the info from the SKIP database? Yes, but not for what you think. Um, so uh, at face value, what the... This is all part of the waste framework directive. And what it's supposed to be for is so the waste provider can look up a product and know when they're disposing of what the risks are. It's not going to be used or extremely rarely at a product level for the recycler. Um, it's there for three reasons. One is a recycler reason where the recyclers instead will have a data aggregation and look at what part types, that's why you have materials codes and customs code, what part times of dangerous chemicals and whether or not they have to change their health and safety processes from their workers. Is lead getting up in the air or what is the chemical in what? 
So when you do a weed treatment instructions, which is required for any electronic product being sold in the EU market, they have a number of parts to identify. And it isn't like lead and brass and that kind of stuff. It's basically, I need to know the power cord is, the CRT monitor, the button cell batteries, the batteries, et cetera, because they have different recycling rules. Some are harder to recycle, some are just plain flammable, some are dangerous. And so what they'll use it for is data aggregation to determine, you know what, we keep having this dangerous chemical is in these. So for these types of parts, not for this product, for these types of parts, we're going to have different safety. Um, and that's one of the reasons it exists. But the other reasons, A, is the consumer businesses the ability to tangibly get at the restricted materials information. So anyone can look up a product, whether a consumer product, industrial product. That is a big part of it. But the third one, and it's actually a very powerful one, is data aggregation for ECHA. And for the EU Commission, where, for example, they're looking at over 100 substances to add to ROHS right now. That list is based on, A, reach chemical registration data, but that's around chemicals, not physical products, and around SVHCs. And they're determining whether or not any of these are reasonably in electronics and should they restrict it. Is there any value in it? What they'll use this instead is good data aggregation saying, hey, look, lead is in this all the time, or phthalates are in this, or TMPP is in this, this customs code, this material. Maybe we should look at restricting under reach or ROHS, that material or that application. So they're going to use it to tangibly prioritize which substances will be further regulated in reach or ROHS. That's the probably biggest overall value where they now have a tangible uh, ability to aggregate, not by time, there's no volume information, but at least material type where they get the best bang for the buck and restricting carcinogens and mutagens and reproductive toxins and endocrine disruptors and this, that, and the other. I build, I build HVAC products. Can I group various components as groups or I must report individual components? Depends. It's a great answer. Really handy. Um, it depends what the saleable item is. And replacing parts would be a little bit different. But imagine it's, it's units. You normally have to group them together, something in the same way you group data sheets. You might have a data sheet for the HVAC 100 series, which includes a bunch of different variations. You often um, group them at the same level you group data sheets, a little bit of leeway. They have to have the same descriptor. It's the S1000 model, uh, or whatever, however you group them, say it's in data sheets. It has the same customs code and the same declarable components within reason. So at the product level, sale of product, they can be they can usually group the same way you group your data sheets. At the component level, you can group individual ones according to what we talked about today, a brass component, steel component, et cetera. As long as they can be described the same way, they're simple components, same customs code, same SVHC, same materials category. Um, when in doubt, it's extremely worthwhile. We do a skip web demonstration, explain to you and, and any other stakeholders what the rules are, and then literally do the declaration product and component level for your product at Excel, which is more tangible for humans, because not everybody's into IUCLID, and then the IUCLID version. Um, you have safe use instructions referencing waste streams. Well, I guess it seems to say waste should be considered. Reach does not actually appear to include waste as part of its use. Why are these? It's because of the chemical. And the reason we have waste instructions is in the safe, a number of the SVHCs are bioaccumulants and all of their safe use instructions around disposal. So, and this is for the waste framework directive. So anything that has a safe use instruction at the chemical level, which is around disposal, and you have to look at. So carcinogens and reproductive toxins have problems on the waste stream. But more important is bioaccumulants. And bioaccumulants are, their problem is not the fact you touch it. Their problem is bioaccumulation. So the safe use instructions for bioaccumulants like dechlorine plus or D6 um, are all around disposal. Just happens to be that's why they're SVHCs. Where do the safe use instructions come from? Really good question. There is no pull down menu. Um, we create them in our templates. And what we use as a basis, we take the chemical safe use instructions. So when each one of the chemicals on the SVHC list, basically every single one, I believe, is actually registered as a chemical. Inside it, there are agreed upon safe use instructions for the chemical. Now it's for the chemical, which can include airborne and, and, and liquid and ingestion and so on and so forth, which may not apply to you. So for lead ones, we don't normally use the airborne ones unless there's a particular reason for your product. We use the um, usually casual contact. There is a difference for wearable. Wearable has dermal exposure, gets absorbed through the skin. But most exposures for lead or phthalates are casual touching. And it comes off in your fingers. It comes off in the sweat acid for lead or the oils for phthalates. And then you touch your food, your mouth, and you ingest it. And that's the exposure. So the safe use instructions are what we create are from a subset of the chemical 
safe use instructions in the REACH registration dossier, the ones that apply. Now, sometimes we do further refinement. So uh, let it brass, the main warnings are around the fact if you touch it, it comes off in your finger and you shouldn't, and you have to wash your hands before eating. Not actually that different than COVID often is considered. Um, however, if the brass component is internal and there's no reason a user should touch it, you may not put the safe use instructions around casual contact. So it depends a little bit on it. Um, for safe use instructions, would you consider the article on its own or as in the product? So normally we keep all the safe use instructions at the component level because that's where the SPHCs are. We do sometimes put safe use instructions at the product level, the saleable item, but in those cases, it's usually around do not dismantle the product. And if we put in safe use instructions at the product level, they're almost always a copy paste from the instruction manual that has something about not taking the product apart. And so if we're going to use ones at the product level, they're almost always copy paste from current safe use instructions in the operations manual, usually around not taking it apart, or IFU. Um, all of the chemical safe use instructions, we keep at the component template level. Receiving FMD data for RHS is similar and has been near impossible. How do you foresee suppliers being able to provide this information as well? Um, well, we're generally not as reliant on the suppliers. When we do a declaration, we declare it on the material type. This material can have this. It can have lead in it. And then as long as you declare, you're compliant. And then you can choose to do testing or data gathering to reduce that number. But if you've already let it brass, does it really matter if you're declaring seven or three? So, um, and at full material declarations also lies, lies, more lies. Um, my favorite part is anybody believes in it, is I will take capacitors that are identical, physically, chemically identical to tube suppliers, put them next to each other, and you will have no idea they're the same part. Um, also, what a chemical is is not a religious purity. They have a lot of impurities. Any new SVHC comes along is almost never containing FMD. Trinonophetal phosphate is a good example. It's an antioxidant. It's inside the polyethylene declarable. It's inside the polyolefin. It's not previously declared. You have to regather your FMD every time. And it's actually untruthful most of the time. So not useful. The way they normally provide it is if you wish supplier data, they just declare what SVHCs they have. For extremely complex products, industrial printing press, which I, by the way, have done uh, reach SVHC declarations for full-blown industrial printer printing press you near know, the size of half my size of my house. Um, does you have to say where it is? Nope. The rules are the saleable item, the SVHC, and the component type it's in. That's it. You don't have to say it's the brass component in the uh, printer head. No, nope. you just have to say the printer, brass component, lead. It's much easier. We have, you gave brass components an example. By the way, it's a great question. If I don't get to yours, I apologize. There's lots and there's lots this morning. Um, you gave brass components an example, but we, for us, the component uh, is coil brass isolation. Uh, if both SVHC lead in the brass and the SVHC in the resin have it, do we split them into two components? Um, we'll look into the situation in general, not in all cases. Um, the SVHC in ink or paint for coatings is not a declarable until it's painted onto a surface. As long as it's governed by a safety data sheet, like paint is until it's applied, um, it doesn't have an SVHC Article 33 skip declaration requirement. Once it's painted on, one of the most common is TGIC and powder coating. Once it's powder coated on, it's residual TIGGIC, which by the way, is quite small after it's painted on, it's quite uh, volatile. Um, it's over the weight of whatever it's painted on. And, and it goes into a lot of detail in the ECHA uh, guidance on articles. So if you have an SVHC or paint or coating, it's usually trivial over the weight of whatever it's painted or coated on. There are exceptions, big epoxy, but most SVHCs, even in epoxy, fully polymerize and the actual value drops heavily from what's in the original safety data sheet to the final product. So rarely, and I can think of one or two exceptions, are epoxies or coatings uh, declarable? If that did occur, we normally list the brass component and the epoxy coating as two separate articles. But generally, most things in coatings don't end up being declarable. There are a few exceptions. Uh, please explain primary identifier type selection rules. It's kind of a meta, almost, it's actually almost a really metaphysical. Uh, consumer product is easy, it's basically UPC or barcode. Professional products, it's whatever you can honestly des describe your product as as a primary, often use model number. And then the secondary line is anything you need to clarify the model number. So it's the, I use the made up a number SM series. 
um, analyzer. And a secondary name we said is the SN100, the SN200, the SN300, and any variation thereof. So professional products, a lot more leeway as long as it's honest and truthful. Consumer products, it's basically the UPC code. Uh, using the coffee machine, the glass may have lead oxide. Nope. The glass has lead a glass. I know it, it sounds bizarre, and some of the suppliers will declare lead oxide, but um, from a technicality, lead oxide used to make glass is now lead a glass. Right. Oh, actually, you do say that. Sorry. But according to the glass industry, it's lead a glass. Actually, you've got that. Bang on. Sorry about that. Um, thus, we don't need to declare the SVGC. Correct. Sorry, I should have read the the question. The question is, um, it's made with lead oxide, but the glass association says it's lead a glass. Do we have to declare it? No, not in lead a glass. Now, the exception is Cermat trimmer pots because it's actually a lead oxide adhesive layer as opposed to glass or ceramic. It's a bit of a bizarre situation. Um, but normally, lead glass is not an SVHC because the SVHCs are lead metal and lead oxide. Lead glass is a different chemical. So the unknown variable composition, biological UVCB, um, different chemical that is not lead oxide. And that's the current position. Um, it gets really exciting when you get to diboron trioxide. Uh, if you try to test for diboron trioxide, um, it's used to make borosilicate glass, which is can be in your circuit board. But it's also, if you have glass-filled connector, it's often borosilicate glass. And the test process for it that a lot of people use, it's not the acid that dissolves it, but it's the chlorine ion in HCl will actually cause the borosilicate to dissolve slightly, and you'll get soluble boron. You get diboron trioxide. It's not real. It's an artifact of the test. So um, borosilicate glass is also not diboron trioxide. Even though if you test for it, you'll get soluble boron. But that's because of the test a lot of people use is not for that purpose. And they don't realize the chlorine, not the, the acid, the chlorine in HCl actually will cause borosilicate glass to artificially dissolve. Is it possible to download and install skip for offline testing? Uh, yes, it just appeared. It is literally, we use the online version, it's so easy. But the offline version is, and is what we used for chemical dossier creation is available. You download it, but it is basically the web version on your computer. Yep, you can definitely download it. Who defines custom product? The manufacturer. What you want to do when you declare a product that says this and any variation thereof, you just want to be honest. And if you're the product expert, then who's going to dis disagree with you as long as you're not trying to obviously um, finagle the rules? Um, good example, printers. Awesome. Maybe not very descriptive. You might want to actually do the series or the groupings of printers. What type of enforcement should we expect? The major enforcement, believe it or not, will likely be consumers or news organizations that go in and determine who hasn't done things. Uh, they have a lot more free time. What's going to also affect a lot of aggregation is how good uh, data, uh, sorry, SVHC enforcement or skip enforcement, is how good is the data aggregation tools? If a consumer or NGO, non-governmental organization, look up a part, that's one thing, but what can they do to extract the data from 100 parts? That's a really good question. Well, I don't know what the data aggregation is going to look like. The real enforcement technically is by each member state can choose to enforce, and ECHA will force them all to enforce SVHCs. They actually started a project in 2018 that forced all countries to enforce for each SVHCs. So most of the EU countries created SVHC enforcement capability. And under the new goods package, the new CE marking, which Skip, Skip is not part of, but it follows the same rules, they are, end up every four years, each country is going to have to publish its enforcement plan and then do it. If, oh, that's a really good question. Um, if under the materials category, you go other, and then have to define other, how precise does your definition have to be? You're uh, we're, <laughs> we're deep into a strange land. We're not sure. If you're using it to circumvent the rules, it won't go so hot. But if it's, and there is a case where if you use other, the oxides are not well listed in materials category. So cadmium in switches, the cadmium oxide, um, is not well listed in there. So there's a case where you have to use other. You just have to be descriptive enough. Um, and we really can only use in a situation one of the materials categories doesn't reasonably apply. And we have to do this often for cadmium oxides. Some of the oxides just aren't there. How does Skip manage spare parts? Um, it's a really good question. So what you want to do right now is focus on, and this is separately saleable spare parts. Focus on your finished products. And if somebody asks for your spare part, you say, it's in this declaration. Eventually, they'll make you do all saleable items, including spare parts. And so what you end up doing for the spare parts 
is identifying their SVHCs and then having them point to their generic declaration. So even if you're selling silicone washers, you'd have to, and it's it's sold under this part number or your silicone washer you sell, you'd have to put the saleable replacement part, not off the bat, focus on your main products, but eventually put the replacement part in there and then have it just point to the generic silicone component declarable. So you will have to have replacement saleable items in there. However, right now, especially for professional products, it's fair to assume it's under your main declaration. And if somebody complains, say, hey, it's under the declaration. And they say, well, you really should do it separately. Well, there's no guidance on that. And they go, fine, so get it done by next year. So there's a little more leeway. Eventually, you're very likely going to have to be your spare parts and repair parts in, but you ought to focus on your main products right now. How do component templates address parts that have more than one SVHC? Uh, it depends. So it is rare, uh, but not impossible. Usually they're grouped together, D6, D5, and D4. Um, there could be a situation where you have phthalates and UB320. Um, you need to have a different template for one that's just phthalates versus one that's phthalates and UB320. They'd have to be separate ones. So we have a similar problem in heat shrinks right now, where heat shrinks can have dichlorine plus, or if they're light-colored heat shrinks, can have TMPP. Um, we have them as two separate components. If you have one that declares both, you may have to create a hybrid of both, but it's a very rare situation. We haven't run into it yet, um, but it's not impossible. Normally, fortunately, most UV stabilized plastics do not have other declarable SVHCs. So it's usually one or the other. And the ones that do have multiples, they have multiples for the same reason. The, the monomer. So when you get D6 in a silicone, say at 1200 ppm, you'll have D5 at 900 ppm and, and D4 at 500 ppm. They're all related. Uh, we think component is a really homogenous material. It can be sometimes, but it doesn't have to be. It's really, without getting too metaphysical on it, um, it's the first time where the component no longer requires a safety data sheet. So it's often not homogenous. Um, something with paint on it, a painted screw is actually a component. And yes, the paint is separate from the steel, but for SVHC, it doesn't care. The paint is a chemical until it's applied to the article and any SVHC in the paint is measured over the weight of the screw. And when you get something like a connector, you're like, eh, you could say the body's different than the brass. We just declare the letter brass. As long as you aren't really cheating the system, like you can't go power supply. But as long as it's reasonable, it's fine. But it's not homogenous material. Once in a while, it happened to be. Like we use lead solder because it's a much easier way to describe it. Uh, but it, no, it's not specifically homogenous material. We are a software manufacturer, but sells hardware bought from a CM. How do we utilize the SKIP database? So it depends if your brand is on it or someone else. If someone else is. Um, then you'd often be the distributor and you just require them to have put the declaration in it. If it's under your brand, you have to make sure it gets in there. It doesn't mean you have to have made it, but you have to make sure the skip declaration is in there. And the same thing for a distributor, distributing a, a non-EU product. It's ultimately the importer and the EU's responsibility to make sure it occurred. Normally, the manufacturer is the one that does it, um, but each seller of the product has to make sure the IU in the EU has to make sure the IU code file exists. So often it's done by the manufacturer. If you're buying a brand by someone else, so you buy a Dell computer, you probably just, you, even if you're selling with your analyzer, you probably just reflect th them as a separately separate product that you're just distributing. So, but if it's got your brand on it, you're responsible for making sure it occurs, even though you may have no technical involvement. What document outlines the legal requirements and states what is enforceable and what is not? Not a lot. The Waste Framework Directive has a full whopping like two lines on it. The uh, guidance on articles has a pretty good guidance on what they expect. Um, there are some guidances on skip, but there are a lot of hand wavy and a lot of details. Um, the main legal case, actually there's quite a few on some of the terms like place on the market, but the main legal case is the 2015 European Court of Justice defining what a component is uh, for reaches, reach. Otherwise, there's not a lot. Um, the what's declarable is out of Article 33 of the REACH uh, regulation and basically says you have to declare the saleable item, the SVHC, and then the component that it's in. And that's better defined by a court case from the European Court of Justice in 2015. Thanks for everybody hanging on. I sorry I went over time a little bit. Thanks for all your questions. Everybody register will see the copy. There should be a recorded version of this going up on our website. Um, the next couple of days. And if you have any more questions or you need our help, we're here. If you need something tested, just send us a picture or a web link or a description. We do this all the time. It's easy to quote. 
you need a web demonstration, just contact us. We'll actually build with you for your product the Excel templates and the IUCLID templates. It's really tangible, really effective, and a fantastic way to get started. Thanks, everybody, and hope to talk to everyone again soon.